Now, to lay down a quick ground rule, the views of this presentation are my own and do not reflect the views of the Postal Regulatory Commission or the U.S. government. Now that we've got out, that out of the way, as you might have guessed by the suit, I'm a bit of a stick-in-the-mud, stuck-up kind of guy, and, well, you'd be right. But, you see, it is because of my nature, rather than despite it, that I had the opportunity to do something very interesting and very satisfying with statistical analysis. And that was to create a matchmaking survey for my senior class. This senior class wanted a last chance dance and one last opportunity to match with people in whom they were interested. So using just two questions, select your name and select the names of up to six people in whom you are interested, I was able to match one-sixth of my senior class. Now, I don't exactly know what happened at the dance with the matches, but I believe that's what they have five-year reunions for, so we should find out that. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because this is one example of a non-traditional, accessible, and satisfying way to do data analysis. This is, and this is the key, that more data are available now than at any previous point in our history, and it has never been easier to access or to analyze these data. The insights that we have developed from data analysis would have been impossible in years previous. Take, for example, fitness trackers, Fitbits, Apple Watches, you name it. Just 10 years ago, these devices did not exist, but now we're capable of using these devices to, for example, determine the impact of an earthquake by analyzing how it affects people, by analyzing fitness tracker data to see when people wake up. And, these and this ability to do data analysis has never been more important. In a world getting only more complex by the day, data analysis allows us to take a look at the underlying structure of the world and put order to the chaos. So I'm going to discuss three things. First, the principles of data analysis. Second, let's take, we'll take a look at the tools of the trade, some of them. And third, we'll look at a couple more cool examples. So what are these principles of data analysis? These principles are curiosity and creativity in harmony. Notice that I did not say mathematics, I did not say programming, I did not say technical skills. While these may be helpful at higher levels of data analysis, in getting started, the key is the ability to fuse curiosity and creativity. Let's look at these one by one. Curiosity. What is it that you want to learn? What kind of problem do you want to solve? And these are not necessarily academic problems or large-scale economic problems. This doesn't have to be, what will the stock market look like in six months, or will the Fed raise interest rates at the end of the year? These can be problems or questions for your daily life. What dorm should I pick in order to get the best cell and Wi-Fi reception? How do I determine what apps are draining my phone's battery the most? What time should I go to sleep to maximize my sleep cycle? Or how many calories should I eat to prepare for the marathon in three months? All of these questions are within the realm of data analysis so long as you have creativity. And creativity is the second part. The ability to recognize that you can use data in your search, that of the myriad amount of data available, it is a, that you can access it, and you can use it, that you can see in this problem the way in which data can be taken and transformed to develop insights and solutions. With these two in harmony, we can take a look at the process of data analysis, which I am breaking into two parts. First, the data set. Some collection of data that is related to your question, usually in the form of rows and columns in the sense of a spreadsheet. But by no means is that the only option. An additional way, for example, is GIS data. These are data organized not in terms of rows and columns, but by region, by geography. Take, for example, storm tracking. GIS data are used to understand the path of hurricanes as they may or may not make landfall. Or, for another example, cell reception. You can use GIS data to pinpoint where reception in an area is strongest, so you can figure out either what dorm to pick or where to place your computer so you can binge watch your next Netflix marathon without having to worry about streaming interruptions. And, additionally, when it comes to data, there are both traditional and non-traditional sources available. It's important to think outside the box, and we will discuss a couple of these out-of-the-box sources soon. The second part of the process is a program, 
some tool to comb through your data set and provide you with the results necessary. And we'll discuss a couple of those options as well. But first, let's look at some sources of data. First, we have economic data. This is a more traditional source of data from such places like the Federal Reserve, the Bank of International Settlements, or the World Bank. These data are monthly, quarterly, weekly economic releases detailing the state of the US and the world economy. Things like inflation, unemployment, GDP, sovereign debt, and can be used to take a look at larger scale economic trends. What will the stock market look like in six months? What will the US GDP growth look like in six months? How does, the U how does European sovereign debt affect European growth? And among other factors. And these data are all very easy to access through these web portals. But this is still some of the more traditional stuff. Let's look at some less traditional stuff. Take, for example, survey data. We've all taken surveys at some point in our lives. And if you're a student at Hamilton College, you probably get two to three surveys in a given week. What happens with those data after you take the survey? Well, usually a researcher will take the data, use it for their pet, use it for their research project, and present the results. But that leaves a lot of opportunity lost to analyze these data in new and creative ways. And that is where the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social, Social Research comes in. They're a group that exists to, heart, to, load, to upload and store research projects and data from a variety of social science papers, open to anyone to take a look at data and develop insights of their own. Another example of survey data is the US Census Bureau which puts out its decennial census and its American Community Survey to take a look at demographic data across the nation, whether it's demographic data, income, education, marriage status. So if, for example, you wanted to figure out where to move after graduation based on the number of available singles, the census data would tell you that if you're seeking a woman, stick to the East Coast, and if you're seeking a man, go to the West Coast. I do not suggest this as a way to pick what city to go to after you graduate. A third source of survey data is the General Social Survey, put out every other year by the University of Chicago. This 40-year-long survey tracks the pulse of American society. It examines ideology, religiosity, income, happiness, and a variety of other factors that, are in, that influence our American social fabric. Which will, so analyzing these data can allow you to track happiness over time, divide happiness by gender, by ideology, even divide ideology by a variety of factors. These data represent an excellent way to try and understand what motivates the American polity today. But even still, survey data is a relatively traditional source. So let's look further outside the box. Take, for example, the DC Capital Bike Share. This is a ride-sharing program in our nation's capital, which puts every single biking transaction data on its website. So every time a bike is taken out and put back in, is cataloged. And this is particularly useful to somebody like me who's trying to figure out what time to leave the office to get the nearest bike at the nearest dock instead of having to walk five extra blocks. But it can be very useful for other purposes as well, to determine transportation flows, to figure out how best to avoid the metro, and a variety of other things. Secondly, there's fitness trackers. As I've mentioned, these, the, these trackers have not existed for very long, but the widespread availability of them allow us to do massive health-related studies that were previously impossible because of empirical limits and limits of access to people. A third source of data comes from our own writing. The felsch Kinsade Readability Statistic is a statistic that is used to analyze how easy or difficult something is to read. And this was developed by the Navy to defer their own manuals. Keep this in mind, because we're going to look at this one a little bit later. Now that we understand a bit about the data available, let's look at some programs. First among these is Google Spreadsheets. This is a spreadsheet software that is developed by Google in order to provide a collaborative editing environment. And the collaborative part is key. The collaboration allowed here helps you to develop insights with others that you may not have been able to develop on your own or just phone in a friend to have him look at your data. Uh, additionally, Google Spreadsheets has a new functionality called Explore, which will analyze the data for you and attempts to pull out certain trends. And so these trends uh, are what Google thinks are important and are an excellent way to start understanding the creativity needed for data analysis, an excellent way of understanding what can I see within these data and what can I find? And eventually, can I see things that Google's algorithms can't? On the other side of the fence, there's Apple Numbers, which is Apple's 
collaborative spreadsheet editing environment. Like Google's, it allows you to work together with others to develop insights that others cannot, and it is very skilled at data visualization, being able to create charts and graphs to understand the trends and factors within the data. And this is a key point to analyzing data, which we will look at very soon. Third, there's Microsoft Excel, something you've probably all heard of. It's more or less the standard in statistical and in spreadsheet analysis, and even contains the ability to do some limited statistical analysis. It also has the ability to do forecasting now, the ability to take a trend and project it out into the future to try and determine what exactly it will be. Take, for example, what will the stock market look like in three months? What will my portfolio, what will my 401k look like in two years? Or what will my electric bill be next month? All very important things for the purposes of budgeting. Now that we understand a little bit about the programs and a little bit about the data, let's take a look at some examples. This first example was motivated by curiosity about my writing and trying to understand how my writing has developed over time and by discipline. Here, I took all of my papers going all the way back through high school, which involved reading those papers, a somewhat embarrassing affair, and calculating the felsch kinsade readability statistic for each of them. So what you'll see on the far right is each paper has a number between 1 and 18, where 1 is something written at a first grade reading level, and 18 written for something, someone with a postgraduate reading level, and everything in between. So taking these data and analyzing them over time, we see that my writing style has become more and more complex as I went through college until about my senior year when it finally started to tail off. If we take Polonius at his word that Beverly is in fact the soul of wit, then it took me a good while to finally learn that lesson. But that's not the only way to look at these data. As we, I, I majored in both economics and philosophy, so I was curious just how did my writing vary between the disciplines. And what these data suggest is that I was much wordier in economics than I was in philosophy. And looking at some of the papers that I've written, I'm inclined to very much agree. Now, as some of you may be wondering, how is this helpful for me? And the truth of the matter is, it can, you can do these analyses yourself to take a look at your papers and see how your writing develops over time. Or these data, this process is extensible. It can be applied not just to one person, but to groups of people. Consider a writing center that may want to develop a diagnostic tool to analyze the writing among its students and track student writing over time. Analysis of widespread felsch kinsade readability statistics with a collection of demographic data about the students, what their major is, what papers, what kind of papers they're writing, page length, etc., can help develop a tool to understand and improve writing throughout the entire service of, the writing of a writing center. This next example is motivated more by creativity. How, e how can I easily create a dating service, that a matchmaking service, in a very short amount of time? And so, what we have here is a very simplified version of that matchmaking service, where each row represents the uh, responses of that person to the people listed in the column. Take, for example, the top row, Taylor. The zeros mean she's not interested in the person in the column, so she is not interested in Taylor, Bruno, or Kate. But she is interested in Sam, Selena, Nate, and Kanye. For, or consider the Kanye row. He's expressed interest in everybody, including himself. <laughs> Using a little bit of matrix algebra, we can transform these data into a fully-fledged matrix where each cell has three possible values. A zero means that neither party is interested in the other. So, for example, neither Katie nor Taylor are interested in the other. A one means that one party is interested, but the other is not. So, for example, either Sam or Taylor are interested in the other, but it's not a match. A two is a full-fledged match. So, for example, Taylor and Selena. And so this is useful if you need to create a quick and easy dating service for uh, a one-time job. And so, this is a, so these, however, are only the tip of the iceberg. There is much more to see and much more to learn within the realm of data analysis. Take, for example, regression analysis. Analyzing a trend by trying to figure out what factors influence it. Say, for example, what factors influence Americans' belief in their own happiness over time? Is it wealth? Is it income? Is it religiosity? Is it political ideology? Regression analysis makes this kind of analysis possible. 
Or take, for example, and using fitness tracker data to analyze weight over time based on macronutritional content, exercise, and sleep data, which is what many fitness apps attempt to do now. Or another more advanced tool is forecasting, taking a look at a trend and trying to project it out into the future, whether it's stock prices, electric bills, the number of hurricanes we'll see in a given season. Forecasting makes this possible. To do some of these analyses require some more advanced programs, things like R or SAS. And these programs do require some level of coding skill. However, at its core, data analysis remains the fusion of curiosity and creativity. The curiosity to see the world around you and, the, and wonder why, and then the creativity to take the massive amounts of data available to us today and put them to use in understanding the world. And with the data available and with the programs available, this has never been easier. In the end, your curiosity and your creativity are your only limits. Thank you.